Standing on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Standing on the promises cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises, Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally through love's strong cord, overcoming daily by the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises, sing it like you believe it, church. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Good morning. Okay. How are we? Good. good. We're good. Would you kindly join me in the call to worship, please? In every corner of the globe, a question arises. Who is God? And among his people, an answer comes forth. He is the one who made the world and those who dwell in it. A father, a king, a shepherd, a shield, immortal, invisible, unchanging, forgiving, merciful, faithful, and just. He loves us with a love greater than any other. How marvelous it is, how wonderful it is to know that we who were once dead in our sins may now have life abundant and beautiful by the blood of Christ. How marvelous it is, how glorious it is to know that we are his beloved children, holy and blameless in his sight. How blessed we are to know these things. How blessed we are indeed. Would you pray with me, please? Father God, how blessed we are to know these things, to know who you are, great and majestic, holy and perfect. How blessed we are to know that we are your children and how blessed we are to know that when we gather in this place and when we sing and we lift up our hearts that you hear us. Lord God, be with us today. Give us your wisdom. Let us experience your presence and be filled with your Holy Spirit who shows us who you are each and every moment of every day. In Christ's holy name we pray, amen. to me he has 
may be seated. Would the ushers kindly come forth for me, please? I got one. I need three more. Come on. You, you. Oh, oh no, we're coming. You're good. Thank we you. already got them. Walk as fast as That's okay. Walking. That's all right. <laughs> You. Would you pray with me, please? Gracious and holy God, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect your nature, which is generous. We thank you for the opportunity to give, Lord, because you have been such a gracious giver to us. May these gifts that we give joyfully and out of the abundance that you've poured onto us be used to glorify you and for the work of your kingdom. Amen. In 
Today we'll be reading from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, chapter 4, uh, 17 through 25, and Psalm 106, uh, chapter 1, 6 through 12. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chooses, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. He has made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the, full f for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hopes on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you in him you also, when you heard the word 
of truth the gospel of your salvation and had believed in him were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Now from Ephesians chapter 4, 17 through 25. Now this I affirm and assist on in the Lord. You must no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. They have lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to li lis licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way you learned Christ. For surely you have heard about him and were taught in him as truth is in Jesus to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and deluded by its lusts, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Then, putting away falsehood, no, oh, so then, putting away falsehood. Let each of you speak the truth with your neighbor, for we are members of one another. Now from Psalms, uh, chapter one, six through 12. Praise the Lord, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good for his stead, oh wait, It was, sorry. Both we and our ancestors have sinned. We have commit, committed inequity, have done wickedly. Our ancestors, when they were in Egypt, did not consider our, your wonderful works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled against the Most High at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake so that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. He led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe and delivered them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. That is the word of God for the people of God. Oh, 
Would you all pray with me, please? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the word that you have given us, that guides us, that teaches us, that shows us who we are, and most importantly, who you are. May the words that come out of my mouth today and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Earlier this month, I was invited to be a part of a writer's round called 19 Miles to Music Row, which is hosted at Franklin First United Methodist Church. And it was a blast. I could not have been more excited to be there. It had been four years since I had done a writer's round. So I was a little nervous, but I was very excited to be there. And for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time in downtown Nashville or just aren't on the music lingo, a Writer's Round is a staple industry event where established or up-and-coming songwriters will gather for an audience and they'll play usually two or three songs and they go one after another in a round. Now, I was excited for this round and I was eager, I had the jitters, I was eagerly anticipating it. And then right before I was about to go on stage, those eager jitters flipped into full-blown anxiety. Thoughts of forgetting my words and (laughs) cracking my newly recovered voice, cracking, it flooded my mind. And I was in an adrenaline-fueled panic. This experience happens nearly every time I perform now. Stage fright, some call it. And the thing about it is that stage fright never used to be a part of my performing experiences. I can recall vaguely a time when I was a little girl who was dying to get on any stage, ready, wanting to sing, bold and unafraid, confident in her ability. But somewhere along the way, someone very close to me once told me, you are only as good as your last show. And that changed everything. From that point on, every show that I did was a litmus test, gauging my worth and ability, pressure mounting year after year, show after show, because to me, having a successful career in music was paramount. And as someone who is already a high-achieving individual who strives for success in everything that she does, any mistake, however minor, was devastating and crippling. Achieving became an all-consuming thought for me, and I put my obsessive and perfectionistic way of behaving as just being dedication to the craft. And I convinced myself and everyone else that I loved what I did. But truthfully, that little girl who just wanted to sing and write and perform had been forgotten a long time ago. So as I was preparing to go on stage for this writer's round, I'm sitting there begging God, please don't let this show be a failure. Please don't let me mess up. Please don't let me be a disappointment again. 
And I'm so glad that the Holy Spirit interrupted me so kindly and said, have you forgotten who you are to me? You don't have to beg for my attention or for my favor or for my blessing. You are my daughter, my beloved. And I realized in that moment that I was having a bout of spiritual amnesia that was causing an identity crisis. My anxiety in that moment revealed that I had forgotten who and whose I was. And spiritual amnesia is not an uncommon ill. In fact, every one of us has experienced it at some point in our life. None of us are safe from this lapse in memory of who God is and who he has been to us. And it's evidenced throughout all of scripture. I mean, y'all pick a page, it's there. Take, for example, Nicole's preaching that she gave a couple weeks ago about the golden calf in the Exodus story. You can blame that on spiritual amnesia that settled among the people who forgot these incredible divine acts of rescue that God had performed for them in Egypt just chapters earlier. In Psalm 106 that Coda read for us today, verse seven of the scripture identifies the moment that that ill settled in on the people. Our fathers did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love. Spiritual amnesia is effectually wrapped up in this question of identity. Who am I? And it's a very important question to ask. Our understanding of ourselves is formative in shaping our thoughts, our behaviors, our feelings. Perhaps you've asked this question of yourself or maybe you've asked its companion questions. What is my purpose? Why do I exist? These are large existential questions and if you look to culture for answers, you will get an array of responses, which most of them end up settling somewhere between follow your heart and do what makes you happy. Affirmations like I am loved, I am blessed. When they have nothing to anchor them, they're just hollow platitudes that do very little to calm the anxieties and fears and doubts of hurting people. And if you don't believe me, you can ask any reporting body, the CDC, Anxiety and Depression Association of America, my generation is the most anxious generation up to this point, coupled with rising substance abuse and suicidal ideation. And you have to wonder why that is. You have to wonder if culture has the answers to identity, why? For the longest time, I, like many of my peers, got my identity wrapped up in my career, wrapped up in my doing. That my achievement and my success, that was my work, my worth, my work was my worth. And it wasn't until two summers ago, just two years ago, that I had a radical encounter with the Lord that completely changed my life. And on my bedroom floor, by his grace, I was made completely aware that my identity is to be in him and him alone. And every single person sitting in this room is making that very same assertion, that our identity goes beyond ourselves, because we identify as Christians, as Christ followers. And in our call to worship earlier, the response of that, who is God, well, that really is the answer to the question, who am I? Because we are made in his image. We are the very likeness of the Almighty. Who we are is reflected in God. But it seems like the church, both locally and globally, is having an identity crisis in a major way. We have allowed culture to compromise our creeds and confessions. We've glorified the experience of church fixated on growth strategies, making ourselves more attractive. And the church has become, as so brilliantly put in this song, Still in America by Lecrae, a Broadway production for relevance, having traded the kingdom to build an empire, so people don't trust us, apparently. It would seem to me that in that fourth chapter of Ephesians, that perhaps it is really us who is darkened in our understanding. Perhaps it is really us 
who are alienated from the life that God has called us to, preoccupied with fitting in and toning down when we should be picking up crosses and putting off old ways. Friends, it is impossible to do the work that we are called to do as Christians and have a correct view of ourselves and reflect the image of God if we do not know the God that we are reflecting. And this knowledge of God comes from one place, this, the Bible. Yes, I am really doing a sermon on why it is important to read the Bible. And this may seem like a no-brainer, right? Christians read the Bible, that's what we're supposed to do. Yet I think that this bears repeating and it is a topic worthy of discussion because I have found that an overwhelming majority of people who call themselves Christians do not read this book with any measure of consistency or frequency. I would know, I was one. Before my experience two years ago, I would have adamantly said, yeah, I was a Christian. And I was not in any sense of the word. I didn't read Bible ever. I never read the Bible. I went to church, yeah. I would tell you that I believed in God and I could regurgitate the gospel to you that Jesus Christ died in my sins, but I did not believe that in my bones. I did not believe it. I did not know the truth. I did not understand who he was. I did not surrender my life or my will. I bore the name of Christian in vain. That is what it means to take the Lord's name in vain to some degree. It is to take on that name of Christ and you don't actually believe it and you don't actually walk in it. I am confident that were it not for God's merciful grace encountering me those two years ago, I would have been among those people that he talks about in Matthew chapter seven that say, Lord, Lord, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you. Y'all, I grew up in church, vaguely, sorta. <laughs> I grew up in church, I sat in pews, I took communion, I did the thing, I was here. And I did not know God. And so I did not know me. I did not, as Paul David Tripp so brilliantly puts it, know that I was a gallery of his glorious grace. I did not find myself with the overwhelming desire to worship like the psalmists do and live a life of righteousness until I began spending my mornings, every morning during the pandemic, reading this word, savoring this word. Y'all, this word is life. It says so. And I can just give you an example. I mean, you'd flip to any page, but specifically Proverbs 4. Let your heart hold fast to my words. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forsake her and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. She will keep you, love her, and she will guard you. This is the way of wisdom. This is the path of righteousness. Be attentive to my words. Don't let them escape your sight. Keep them within your heart for they are life to those who find them and they are healing to all the flesh. This word is life, y'all. This word is truth, the only truth. And there is a lot of talk about your truth, my truth. There is one truth, this truth. When my truth and your truth are confronted with this truth, there is no other. And this word is the only sufficient treatment for spiritual amnesia. Because upon this word is what founds your prayers, your praise, your worship. This is where you get the language for that. And this word shows us who we are without Christ, morally and spiritually bankrupt in every way. Hearts curved inward on ourselves and in rebellion, dead in trespasses and sin. And then it shows us who God is, holy and merciful, perfect, and in love with his wayward creation, so desperate to reconcile us to himself that he clothed himself in flesh and died a sacrificial death so that we might be united in love again. And then it shows us who we are if we have accepted his gift of immeasurable worth. In Ephesians 1, it 
says we're forgiven of all trespasses, redeemed sons and daughters adopted into his royal household, guaranteed an eternal inheritance, we're lavished with grace and wisdom and favor and blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, lauded as his handiwork, given good things in advance to walk in, called to put off the old self and put on the new, in the likeness of God and his righteousness and holiness, commanded to care for the poor and the weak and the disenfranchised. Y'all, the list goes on and on and on, and that is just one piece of scripture. And we read a lot of scripture today because I think it bears reminding that this is why we gather. Yes, the songs are beautiful and they, and they solidify this faith and this truth that we know, but we don't know it without the word. Our songs are based on the word. Phrases like, I'm loved and I'm blessed, they start to bear a bit more weight when you have this kind of knowledge, when you know who loves you and who is for you and who blesses you and who calls you worthy. How blessed we are to know these things we said in our call to worship. Do you know these things? Do you know them? Do you actually understand the identity that you profess when you tell people you are a Christian? Have you personally done a thorough examination of the scriptures, imploring the Holy Spirit to guide you in all wisdom and carve these words onto your heart? Do you, like the psalmist says in the 119th Psalm, the 131st verse, do you open your mouth and pant, longing for his commandments? I know I do not always, and that is the truth of all of us, that we do not desire God's word. that we disregard it, that we say we'll make time for it later and we put other things in front of it when really this is the place where God wants to meet you and speak to you, to heal you of your wounds, to teach you, to help you walk in the ways of righteousness. This is where he's found. Do you know the God you claim to serve? and the things he asks of you in his service, namely to crucify yourself, your pleasures and your desires and your will and your way, to act justly and love mercy. Do you know who you are and what you are made for? Do you read this book like your life depends on it because your life depends on it? Your faith depends on it. Your prayers depend on it. Your witness in the world depends on it. And church, I feel that we have forgotten the significance of this book. People bled and died for this so that you could have a copy in every single pew, that you could go to a bookstore and buy a copy. People bled and died that you would have the word of God easily accessible to you. Because without this, you will never be changed. We sang in the song, Standing on the Promises of God. This is where the promises are. This is where the gospel is, the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and it was God. I pray that you ask and answer these questions of yourselves, honestly. Because if you do, you may, like I did two years ago, truly encounter the presence of the living God for the first time in your life, and come to know him, and thereby come to know yourself. This week I was asked to lead worship at annual conference in Memphis. And for the first time I was not afraid. I had the jitters, rightfully so, and I get the jitters every time that I stand up in front of a crowd and I think you should, it makes you want to do well. But I was not afraid because I remembered who I was. I reflected and remembered the promises of God that I was made for great things that he prepared in advance that I was made to glorify him in all that I do, that I was made to praise him and worship him. And that was one of my most favorite performances to date, to stand there in a crowd of hundreds and worship the name of God and lift it high and know that I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, that I remembered my identity and remembered who my God was. Y'all, there is no cheat code for this. We live in a time of convenience where we want everything easy, everything instant. And I'm telling you, reading one verse every now and again is spiritual starvation. 
and y'all know what real starvation, y'all know what hanger looks like. <laughs> Spiritual starvation is just as evident. There is no, there's no shortcut to this. Just time and stillness which I think we so often struggle with. Y'all, this is worth it. This is worth the time. This is worth everything because this is your life. Do not skimp or altogether skip this daily bread, which nourishes what you need most, nourishment for your soul. Let his word dwell in you richly. Remember the Lord your God. When we take communion, that is an act of remembrance. Remembrance is intentional. It is not passive. Remember the Lord your God. Walk in a manner worthy of the identity that you claim, lest you forget how to walk entirely. Seek him where he may always, always be found. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, forgive us for forgetting your word, for forgetting who you are. Remind us again, Lord God, how incredible your promises are, how transformative and life-giving this word that you breathed into is. Lord, remind us how transformative the gospel of Jesus Christ is how your son is evident on every page of these scriptures. Lord God, please bring us back into your word on the days when we don't feel like it, when we're not in the mood, when we feel like we've read enough and we know enough. Give us a fresh desire, Lord, to prioritize time in these pages, to prioritize time with you, time in your presence, time abiding and meditating on this holy word. Because if we do, we will be transformed. And our identity, our image will truly reflect that of your son. May we fall more in love with your word this week, Lord, and more in love with you. It's in his holy name we pray, amen. And I pray that we all do have an identity in Christ. And this song speaks of a legacy that hopefully having that identity will lead to a legacy that we can leave behind for others to recall and emulate and hopefully follow into that relationship if they don't have it. Would you please stand with us as we sing, let it be said of us. in me. 
meekness we were ruled by his peace heeding be your glory. Let the word dwell in you richly. Let yourself be found immersed in these pages of scripture, knowing more and more about the God that loves you. Walk in your identity as Christians this week, proud and bold and unafraid, equipped with the knowledge and wisdom of his holy word. Go in grace and peace. Happy Sunday.